Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Designing and Using an Effective Data Management System. This webinar is one of the technical assistance resources available as part of the Maternal, Infant, Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. Today's presentation will feature some fabulous speakers. First is Dr. Robert Ammerman. Dr. Ammerman is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Behavioral Medicine and Clinical Psychology at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and the scientific director of Every Child Succeeds. He received his PhD in 1986 in clinical psychology from the University of Pittsburgh. He is a diplomate in cognitive and behavioral psychology from the American Board of Professional Psychology. Dr. Ammerman's research interests include enhancing early childhood prevention programs with a focus on maternal mental health, trauma, and social-emotional development in children. Through an R34 awarded from NIMH, he was the co-developer of an in-home cognitive behavioral therapy and an adapted CBT approach for depressed mothers receiving home visitation. He is engaged in a programmatic research effort that seeks to explicate the impacts of depression and trauma on maternal and child outcomes in home visiting programs. Additional ongoing research includes a study of motivational interviewing to increase retention in home visitation and using quality improvement science to improve outcomes in prevention programs. In addition to NIMH, Dr. Ammerman is the recipient of grants from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, National Institute on Disabilities and Rehabilitation Research, and the Vera I. Hines Foundation. Our second speaker today is Nova Rose. Nova is an Information Systems Project Manager at Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County. Nova has more than 12 years' experience providing data system solutions for both private and public sector organizations. Since 2006, she has focused her skills in the area of project management by working on complex, multiple stakeholder projects. Ms. Rose has worked closely with many government and nonprofit agencies obtaining knowledge in not only the area of data systems, but also in health and human services. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Management Information Systems and Project Management Professional Certification through the Project Management Institute. Our third speaker is Albert Watt. Albert is a research manager at Pre-K Now, a campaign of the Pew Center on the States that advocates for high-quality, voluntary pre-kindergarten for all three- and four-year-olds. In this role, Albert provides the staff and Pre-K Now's network of state and national partners with the latest information on pre-K policies and on developments in early education research. Albert came to Pre-K Now from Georgetown University's Center for Social Justice, where he directed the DC Schools Project, a literacy initiative that trains college students to serve as literacy tutors and instructors for low-income children and adults with immigrant backgrounds in Washington, DC. He previously directed the America Reads program at the University of Michigan and worked with school communities in Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, and Detroit. Albert began his career in California, where he worked with the Bay Area School Reform Collaborative, served as an AmeriCorps member at Partners in School Innovation, a school reform organization based in San Francisco, and taught high school English. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's in education from Stanford University, and a master's in education policy from George Washington University. And finally, Jill Filene from James Bell Associates has been working with James Bell and Child Welfare Practices since 2004. Ms. Filene has more than a decade of experience in applied research, program evaluation, and technical assistance. She has primarily worked in the areas of child welfare, child and adolescent development, and prevention services. Ms. Filene is currently directing the national cross-site evaluation of the replication of demonstrated effective prevention programs, otherwise known as family connections, a component analysis of home visiting programs, and a component analysis of parent training programs. In addition, she works at JBA's projects to provide evaluation technical assistance to agencies implementing demonstration projects funded by the Children's Bureau, including a cluster of grantees implementing home visiting programs. Prior to joining JBA, Ms. Filene worked as a research fellow for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she worked on replication studies, a meta-analysis of parent training programs, and provided evaluation technical assistance to statewide effectiveness trials of evidence-based child maltreatment prevention programs. 
Ms. Filene has extensive experience conducting systematic literature reviews and synthesizing research findings regarding child maltreatment, including reviews of home visiting programs, child maltreatment prevention programs, school-based child sexual abuse prevention programs, and risk and protective factors for child sexual abuse perpetration. She has worked on the evaluations of several national home visiting models. I also want to acknowledge the contributions of Jody Short and Electra Small in, this, in today's presentation. Briefly, I just want to tell you about the DOVE project. DOVE stands for Design Options for Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Evaluation. The, the aim of this project is threefold. First, to design the options for the federal evaluation of evidence-based home visiting programs. Evidence, the second is evaluation-related technical assistance for the promising approaches. And finally, is technical assistance for grantees, continuous quality improvement, management information systems, and benchmarks. The Dove team includes James Bell Associates, MDRC, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and Every Child Succeeds, as well as a host of a number of outstanding consultants. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Ammerman to get started. Uh, thank you. Uh, the goals of today's session are, uh, we have three of them. Uh, first is to review why an effective data management system can be useful for home visiting programs. So how these kinds of systems can, can be used uh, to uh, Im improve the quality and the impact of our programs. The second is to identify the components of an effective, useful, and value-added data management system so that we can uh, consider what are the things that we want to have in a data management system so that it meets all our needs. And then uh, to describe features of data management systems uh, that are user friendly so that they are maximally useful and engaging. Uh, in addition to myself, the other two presenters uh, will be presenting uh, their experiences and uh, their perspectives uh, both at the local and state level in uh, designing, adapting, using, integrating uh, uh, systems. So uh, all, all together, we should have uh, an interesting presentation. Uh, to, to open up with a framework for how to think about uh, data systems and, and, and how they're going to be used in, in our home visiting programs, we need to think of these three uh, areas. Uh, the first is the use. Uh, what do we want to use these data systems for? and uh, how do they need to be designed so that they give us what we want. Uh, the second is uh, on the lower left-hand uh, corner of the triangle is we need to consider the user. Who's going to be using these systems and how can we create data management systems uh, that uh, are, are, are friendly and uh, uh, easy to use. And finally, uh, what, are, what are the features? What are the things these data systems have to have so that they bring everything together and make our work more efficient and more impactful? Well, data management systems should, first of all, help home visitors do their job more effectively. So data systems, uh, uh, ideally, you know, should, should not be burdensome and slow people down and make their work harder, but in fact, make their work better. So a good data system will do that. The second thing is uh, a good data system helps home visitors do their jobs more efficiently. If they can do their work more efficiently, they'll have more time to devote to the families that they're working with. Third, our data management systems need to serve the needs of families have to serve the needs of families, home visitors, and home visiting programs. So they really need to take into account uh, these different constituencies uh, and, and what they need uh, in the program. Our data management system should also provide options for collection of both qualitative and quantitative data. Of course, when we think of a data management system, we primarily think of quantitative data, and this will indeed be the majority of what a data management system works with. But we also want to have some options to uh, record qualitative features of, of, of doing our work uh, to uh, facilitate uh, supervision and uh, implementation of the program, which gets to our last point, and that is it should collect the kind of data 
and be usable in such a way that it does assist in supervision as well as management of the program and meeting reporting requirements. We need to recognize that there are multiple stakeholders when we, when we uh, select or create uh, a data management system. And uh, historically, this has often been overlooked, and data management systems have been created to meet the needs of only one or two of these groups. But in fact, in home visiting in particular, there are multiple stakeholders. They all have an interest uh, in the data that we're collecting. They all have an interest in uh, the kinds of work that we're doing and the impacts we're trying to bring about. And this includes uh, the families, the people that we're serving, as well as the home visitors, those who are actually providing the service uh, on the ground, the programs, as well as community leaders who support our efforts, uh, and funders, those who fund the work that we do. In terms of use, of course, a data management system uh, is primarily used to store information, store information about the families that we're serving, uh, the, the, the actual home visitation service, what we're doing and how we're doing it, uh, and also the outcome, outcomes. Importantly, the data management system also stores information uh, about benchmarks and, and allows us to uh, fulfill our reporting requirements. Data management systems and the data that we collect can also be used uh, to help us maintain fidelity to the home visitation models that we're, that we're using. Uh, all of the home visitation models have some expectations regarding fidelity, and usually these are expressed uh, in data. And by collecting those data, storing them on a good, easy-to-use data management system, we can monitor fidelity and increase the likelihood uh, that we follow the directives and guidelines of the models. Importantly, data also drives continuous quality improvement. And CQI is, uh, uh, is, is something we're going to use to make our programs uh, maximize their, their impact. And CQI, by definition, is a data-driven process and requires that we collect and use data on a regular basis. Our data management systems also allow, allow us to pull together information from different families, different home visitors, different sites, different programs, and, and even sort of up the ladder to uh, tie together uh, 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 information that we might have at the community uh, or, or, and state level that, uh, so that we can promote learning all through this system. And finally, data management systems allow us to longitudinally track our clients, both within programs but also between programs as they move from one program to the other so that we can follow uh, their progress and improve the services that we offer them. In terms of CQI, if we could just touch upon that uh, for a few minutes, the uh, guidance to states that was uh, uh, recently released calls for the uh, uh, addressing of uh, continuous quality improvement in the updated state plan. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, here so that you can think of the data management system not just in terms of collecting, collecting data so as to report benchmarks, but also how it fits within the CQI plan uh, or the CQI intent. And in the plan, uh, you're going to address how uh, CQI will be developed and how it will be used, both at the local and the state level. You're going to address how data systems will be part of that uh, driving and support of ongoing CQI data. And finally, also how benchmark data from CQI will be obtained and used at the local program, community, and state levels. Uh, this diagram sort of pulls it all together. And as you can see, we are primarily uh, collecting data uh, at, at the local level and uh, using it at the local program level to drive CQI. But we're also moving this up the ladder to, uh, as part of our uh, state programs so that we can tie all of these data together. There is feedback between both the local and the state levels in the inter uh, with our uh, data management system. And of course, 
Ideally, we can also tie them together with other databases and other programs that our families may be involved in uh, and, and in which we want to, to see how they interact. Of course, all of this together is to support the families that we work with and to bring about the best possible outcomes. In terms of uh, essential features of data management systems, first of all, it should be uh, a data management system should have the capability to store data that are important to us. And these are the kinds of questions that, that, that you need to ask as, as you uh, look to the design and development of data systems or the purchase of an already sort of uh, off-the-shelf kind of data system. Is it able to uh, uh, readily uh, uh, store and record the data that are important uh, to the program? It should be easy to use and accessible to all who need to use it. So uh, a system should be usable uh, by home visitors, by supervisors, by program directors, uh, all the way up to state oversight agencies. Data management systems should be flexible. We should be able to move around them easily. We should be able to make changes with a minimum of uh, a, a burden uh, and cost uh, because inevitably as, as one moves through programs, one wants to collect new kinds of data and perhaps stops collecting other forms of data. So we need data systems that can adapt to that. Data systems, of course, should be affordable and uh, uh, be something that our resources uh, uh, will be able uh, to purchase uh, or develop. And a data system should be able to produce meaningful reports, reports that uh, are, are easy to read, easy to use, easy to understand, and can help us drive the system and support our CQI efforts. Data systems also ideally should be able to talk to other data systems, and we're going to have more about this uh, later with uh, uh, some of our other uh, uh, presenters. It should be able to link cases within and between systems so that we can readily follow people uh, over time uh, and, and also find them in other systems and, and, and sort of pool in, in information that can help us learn. Of course, data systems should be secure so that confidential information is uh, protected. There should be multi-level access rules and rights so that the people who access these data systems uh, are able to access the information that's important to them, but so that we also protect the confidentiality of other information. So, for example, home visitors uh, might need to access data about their caseload, but a uh, program director might need to access uh, data uh, at the program level involving multiple home visitors and, and, and multiple cases. And at the state level, there may be a need uh, to be able to access uh, all programs uh, within the state. So it, it, it needs to have the capability to be able to set up uh, rules and rights. Ideally, also, it should interface with other software, uh, financial kind of software in terms of uh, paying for the programs and preparing invoices or reports that are required uh, for the financial side, uh, uh, and even, e even email. From the user perspective, uh, one phrase that uh, immediately comes to mind is, uh, uh, don't make me think, which was actually the uh, uh, title of a well-known book by Steve Krug. Uh, who was writing about uh, what web systems should look like. So a data system should be one where you don't have to think a whole lot about it as you're using it. It should be intuitive. It should be uh, easily recognized, and you should be able to maneuver in, in it uh, without a whole lot of experience. It should be engaging and appealing. It should have uh, uh, features and colors and uh, formatting. Uh, that, that is appealing to look at uh, and work with. It should have familiar features, uh, whether it's the pull-down menus or the little X in the upper right-hand corner that closes you out, things that if you've used a computer before, you know what they are because you've seen it before. Ideally, a data management system should also be uh, easy to use. There should be check boxes and radio buttons and pull-down menus. Uh, rather than lots of places where you actually have to write something in. Although, as we said, it's nice to have some, some place to put qualitative data as well. Uh, but if we can store, uh, uh, record our 
our, our data in a data management system uh, just by clicking something, uh, then uh, we will. Uh, it, it's, it'll be much much easier to use. Our data management system should be one where we only have to enter data once. We shouldn't have to sort of put the address in, for example, in three different places. Of course, inevitably, if we're using a data system that does require multiple data entry, somebody's going to make a mistake, uh, and you're going to get uh, confusion within the system. So uh, a good, a well-designed data management system does not allow you to do that. And finally, important information is, is above the fold. We shouldn't have to scroll down all the way to the bottom of the page before we get the most important aspects of, uh, of whatever the page is that we're working with. Also, in terms of uh, 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 things that are important uh, to users, uh, if you do something wrong, you should be able to undo it pretty easily, and there should be a minimal penalty for making a mistake. Uh, if we've spent a lot of time uh, loading some data on and we get the last item wrong, uh, it shouldn't require us to go back to the beginning and start again. It should be something where we can undo what we've done, correct it, uh, and move forward. Good data management systems are, are interactive. They, they provide us with immediate feedback about uh, uh, what we've just entered. Uh, some examples of that are the, are the next bullet point, and that is maybe the, a score on a measure after you've put in all of the uh, data, uh, or, or, or red flags that uh, a particular score on a measure perhaps indicates that a child is developmentally uh, behind, or uh, 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 a mother has a, a score on a self-report depression test that's indicative of, uh, uh, of having difficulties in that area and needing some kind of uh, response. A good data system will allow you to, uh, we will tell you that this is something you need to act on. Uh, that makes it very useful. And finally, a good data system interfaces with the other organizing or management software that you use so that you don't have to just sort of get out and get into something else and go back and forth, which can be clumsy and awkward and annoying. Uh, you have uh, several options in, in how, to, uh, how to create a, 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 or how to, how to get a, a, a data management system uh, in home visiting. And of course, many states already have some systems in place. But assuming that you're starting from scratch, uh, the first thing you can do is, is consider designing one uh, yourself. Uh, and there's some advantages and disadvantages to that. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that it requires a fair amount of resources up front. So you, you need to be able to uh, uh, dedicate the uh, time and effort and uh, uh, cost to uh, create the data, si uh, data system up front. You're also going to be responsible for maintaining it over time. So that includes uh, updates and uh, fixing problems uh, when they arise. On the other hand, an advantage of this approach is you certainly have a lot of choice and flexibility in what the system looks like, what it has, and how it's going to be used. Uh, so th there's no right or wrong here. This is just, it's just a decision. Uh, that you have to make. Others, as we said, are already, are already going to have pre-existing uh, systems and uh, are in a position perhaps to uh, modify or change those uh, systems to meet the new needs of uh, uh, home visiting programs. Uh, the, the good thing about that is it allows you to preserve the database that you've already created uh, and in which you've already made uh, an investment. On the other hand, sometimes that is a uh, technically difficult thing to do, and there may actually be greater cost associated with making those modifications. It depends entirely on what you have and what you want to do. And again, there's no easy or right or wrong answer. Uh, it's just uh, something to be considered as one moves forward. Uh, alternatively, uh, one can purchase a data system. And there are uh, several options. Uh, out there, and they tend to fall into several groups. Uh, some of them are specifically made for home visiting programs, and as a result, the fit is pretty easy. That is, they have many of the elements uh, that that uh, one would want in a home visiting program, uh, and then that can be a good thing. 
Others are broader in their focus. They're, they're designed for, uh, 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 for multiple kinds of programs, multiple kinds of social service programs or clinical management. Uh, and as a result, they may not necessarily be specifically uh, home visiting uh, related. They may fit fine, uh, but they may also uh, uh, not be as, 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 as good or as an easy fit. The advantages of, of, of this kind of approach, of using a commercially available software, is uh, fewer resources are required up front. Uh, some of these programs are going to be more flexible than others. Uh, the control is uh, on, on the side of, uh, uh, of the vendors uh, who, who have uh, produced them, uh, and, and that can be problematic or it can be fine. It really, it really depends, uh, and, and cost uh, can be an issue in either direction. So, so three options and uh, something to consider. We have here a list of some uh, uh, options for uh, uh, data management systems. Th this is by, mean, uh, by no means uh, an exhaustive list. There are a number of options out there. Uh, we're actually going to be trying to collect as many of these as possible to uh, to sort of add to our list and to be a resource uh, for states as as you move forward. But no doubt, as you, as you do your searching, you'll find uh, some of these uh, some that aren't on this uh, this this slide as well. Uh, we don't endorse any of them. Uh, we simply want to point out that uh, th th this will get people started. I think uh, for for those who are starting from scratch. We're considering uh, the uh, uh, the vendor option in terms of identifying uh, a, a good MIS system uh, for them. So to, to tie this all together in, 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 in a checklist, sort of what, what to think about as, as one goes through the process of figuring out how am I going to uh, handle this uh, data system issue? Am I going to make my own? Am I going to modify what I have? Or am I going to go out and, and, and purchase something? Keep in mind flexibility and customizability. That is, can you really make it fit your needs? Make sure it's easy to use and intuitive and engaging. Uh, make sure that uh, it has broad access. That is, a lot of people can use it. And you have real-time access, so you can get on at any point and see what the data are at that point in time. That it has some options for qualitative data collection so that you can have that as uh, uh, part of uh, uh, your work, that it provides useful information that can drive service, uh, and in particular, that can uh, drive your uh, CQI efforts, that it creates useful reports that are important to you. Uh, that is, if you want to get to a point where you can't do your work unless you have certain reports that tell you how you're doing and where you need to go, that's an ideal uh, place to be. And also that the system that, that you work with is both affordable and that you're able to address the maintenance needs uh, that are inevitably going to occur downstream. Uh, so with that, let me uh, uh, pass on to our, uh, the, the slides on to our next speaker, uh, Nova Rose, uh, from Palm Beach County in Florida. Hello. I will be walking through a local perspective of building a data management system with you this afternoon. Um, I work with the Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County, and just to give you an idea, we're an independent special district that was established in 1986. And our mission is to enhance the lives of children and families within the county. And to do this, we actually plan, develop, fund, and evaluate programs and promote public policies within Palm Beach County. In Children's Services Council, we have a number of systems of care, and um, we have a health beginning system of care and a quality count system of care. And today I'm going to be talking mostly about health beginnings because we have had an interesting trip or journey with our data systems, and I'm sure you'll find it pretty enlightening. <coughs> In 1997, we started um, system funding with maternal child health, and then through to 2004, when we started a new infrastructure for maternal child health, had a more comprehensive set of programs. 
But come 2009, we sat down and we looked again at what we were doing, how we were funding programs, and thought about what our families and children in the county need from us, and we actually started a new system of care called Healthy Beginnings. Currently, Healthy Beginnings consists of 19 external agencies. We're providing almost 30 early intervention and prevention programs to pregnant women and families through the age of age, um, through the age five. So to get to the data systems, <coughs> initially we had a system called Right Track. In 2001, we um, worked with a vendor to develop a system called Right Track. It was based on Oracle, and we worked with it until 2007. And naturally, as time progresses, there are so many changes within your business model that you need to change your data system. So we um, upgraded Right Track to a system called Focus, which means Family Outcomes and Child and um, Information System. We used the system 2007 to 2009, but if you remember the slide before, in 2009 we changed to the Healthy Beginnings um, system of care. And what that meant, we went from um, funding a host of programs and families going to different programs for whatever they needed to having it more streamlined where there were um, entry agencies so families would come through an entry agency and then would funnel out to um, services and um, whatever other programs they needed. So we had the data system in place, but it was not created to manage such a, um, such a scope. So the data system had to be changed. We did that. However, after a few months of using it, the users were quite unhappy because here was a system that was basically taped together to do what um, it couldn't really handle. And we heard their screams and their pains, and they kept talking about it. This system is not working for us. We're putting data in. We can't get data out. We heard the frustration. So we went through a process of um, doing a competitive bid process to bring, a, bring in an independent uh, firm to do an assessment of the system. And so what they did, they actually studied the health beginnings model, studied the needs, and they met with individual um, agencies and programs and talked about what, were your, what are your pain points, what's going on, all the complaints that people have had, and compiled all of those. And we looked at focus, and we thought about is it scalable, is it extensible, can we actually continue using the system, should we keep patching it, or is it time to let go? We looked at custom off-the-shelf products, and then um, we had to think about all the other data systems that would need to interface with this system, because there are providers who have their own system, and we would not want to force everybody to use this system if we can pull data from different places into the, um, the, the data system and have people continue working instead of doing double data entry. So from that assessment, we had a number of recommendations. One thing was we wanted to start tracking more family data instead of just um, client by client. So we wanted to track the family because, as we all know, um, the, the, the doses of programs that a family or services that a family receives has an impact, or those combined services, has an impact on the outcome of the life of a child. So because I have a child or there's a child in the home and this child is receiving a certain program, by virtue of the parents getting parent education, it may make a difference in the outcome as opposed to the child who's getting that same program in another home and they might not be having, they might not have additional services. So we want to see from the point, the point of view of the family what this looks like and what's making a difference, what that combination of services is doing and which combination is working for which type of family and all of that. The other thing is we needed clean and accurate data. And 
if you can just imagine, we had gone from one system to the next and then, and then enhanced another system just to get things flowing. And the data was, and still is in some cases, really messy. And we wanted to have good reporting and outcomes measurement. We also wanted holistic program and system management because while it is a system of care, there are programs in that system of care. And every program might not be doing the same thing, but all these different programs need to manage your day-to-day -day work. So how do we get one system where you can have that overall view from a system level, or sorry, one data system, that you can have that overall view from a system management level, but also allow supervisors and directors to manage their programs and allow the caseworkers and home visitors to manage their um, information and be putting in their data. And of course, we wanted it to be cost effective and something that was hosted, so it would be a web application, so wherever people are, they could get onto the system and put in their case notes or figure out what's going on with one of their families or one of the clients within uh, the system. So we, the reporting piece became a big thing for us. And this all happened, I will say, over the last year um, in, or year and a half. In 2009, um, in the summer, we started, we did the assessment and it went through, or sorry, in the fall, we did the assessment and it went through to the spring. And one of the recommendations that came out was um, we needed a better reporting system. We needed to pull that data from the back end of focus. We needed to put it into a repository and clean that data. And then once we clean that data, we'd be able to do two things. Whatever we decided in terms of a new system, we'd be able to migrate new da um, clean data into that system, and um, we'd be able to report off of this cleaner data. This has been a huge undertaking for us. It has taken hours upon hours upon hours to clean this data, to go through and remember all the little idiosyncrasies, why we did things a certain way, why does the data look like this, and this was a system with not much validation on the front side of it. So you'll find lots of messy data back there, and it's stuff that we have to clean. But we have to clean understanding that we cannot have false positive data in the system. Um, we decided that we were going to put out an invitation to negotiate. And we would do, um, we would ask for vendors to bid and let us know what it would take to either build us a system or to sell us a package that already exists. And then internally and with some of the um, agencies, we would sit and choose what would work best for us. So we went through that process and we selected a vendor. And in July of um, 2010, we started the project. And the first three months, we just really went through what are the requirements. And what we asked the vendor to do is to come in and sit and talk to the people who would be using the system. Because from a funder perspective, I could tell you what I need. I could tell you what I think they need, but I'd never be able to tell you truly what a caseworker or a home visitor needs when, they, when they're looking at a data system. And so we went through a very long process of sitting with every agency, every program, and saying, what is it that you want this system to do for you? How do you see that happening? Actually, tell us, how do you work on a day-to-day -day basis? What's your business model? What does it look like? Um, we went through that. We came out with a huge requirement document. Everybody went through it and said, oh, this is not what I said, or this is what I meant, or can we change this, can we change that? And we had that to start working with. So we, we are actually in the process of, of um, developing the system. And what we are doing, we're working through, and I might come back to this slide, but we're working through what we call an iterative approach. So we're doing this in three iterations. We're working, um, the first iteration was around clients and family and setting up that structure 
so that users could go through it, get familiar with it, understand what it is doing, and then we went through testing of that iteration. Um, the users went through, they told us, this is not working, that is not working, this is not how I think this should work. When I go out and I'm dealing with this, this is not going to be practical, can we change it? And we went through that process and we did the feedback. So we keep analyzing, designing, developing, documenting, and we keep going through that loop that you're seeing at the top. Um, then our next iteration, which actually is going on right now, is a case and the case management and the referral management piece of a system. And users are actually looking at prototypes. So through each iteration, we prototype. The users look at it, give their feedback, Yes, no, oh, this is great, oh, this is not so great, oh, can it do that, can it do this? And then we sign off and prototype and actually start coding. We've just finished prototype for the second iteration, and we've finished testing the first iteration, but the full system doesn't launch until October. What this does for us, if you remember um, before in one of Robert's slides, he talked about transforming the users into owners. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with this system. The, what we had done before with focus on the other systems, we had built a system and said, here it is, go forth and do good things. But that didn't work out so well. So right now we're having the users own the system. We're saying, this is yours. And if you want it to be purple, say you want it to be purple. If you want it to be blue, say blue. It's all about the users. How do you want it to look? When you click, what do you want to see? Now, there are 19 agencies and us and Children's Services Council working through this. So it's a very tough process, but you can see the rewards because now people are feeling engaged. They are actually commenting, oh my goodness, this is great. I think this is going to be really good. And if we have the buy-in at this point, it's our belief and our hope that at the end of the day, they are going to know the system probably better than I will. So um, that is what we have been working with. And um, I just wanted to give you uh, a feel of how we are doing our data system from a local perspective. And I think I'm going to pass on to Albert Watt from Pre-K Now. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, and I'm very happy that the, uh, the planners uh, invited me to come speak to you all. Let me just start by saying that home visiting is not a focus of my work. Um, but for the past couple of years, I've been involved with uh, a group of um, organizations called the Early Childhood Data Collaborative to sort of help states think through um, what uh, they, they should, um, you know, really, you know, what the process should be for developing these effective early care and education data systems. So I'm going to kind of take you back to a broader macro level of discussion. Um, uh, so let me just begin by saying or telling you what um, the Early Child Data Collaborative is. So, um, so these are the organizations that you see on the slide uh, that came together uh, about a couple of years ago um, because we all kind of were interested in the same thing, which is to provide state policymakers particularly with information and some guidance about the process and policies needed to develop effective early care and education data system. The work that we're doing uh, is funded by the Birth to Five Policy Alliance, the Pew Charitable Trust, and also the Packer Foundation, uh, which is based in California. Um, so this is kind of our charge. Um, our main audience is state policymakers. Um, and what, basically what we're, what we're about is we want to help policymakers make informed decisions about the development and use of coordinated state early care and education data systems. So what we, so, so I won't read the bullet points to you, but basically what we provide is sort of a policy framework, which I'll, I'll go over in a little bit. We also uh, are going to, are tracking state progress in this work, so states can sort of see where, um, you know, how they compare to other states and, also, and, and, uh, and learn from each other. We have provided some case studies, published some case studies, um, and we, we've organized some meetings, uh, cross-state meetings, again, to facilitate some uh, learning uh, among states. 
So let me explain a little bit about uh, our theory of action. And this is basically adapted from um, an organization that's part of a collaborative called the Data Quality Campaign. They've been involved in data systems work uh, in the education arena, in the K-12 education arena, for the last five or six years, and it had too much success. Um, and so when we partnered with them, we felt like the, the sort of process they went through actually was very uh, helpful to, to the early Ken education arena. So what they, uh, what, what we're doing is we're asking states to really begin, before you actually get into the, the, the weeds of what a data system should look like and what data elements collect and store and all that, um, really start with what the policy questions are that the state is interested in um, and that a data system can help answer. Um, and these policy questions, you know, obviously need to be helpful to providers, to parents, um, to teachers and, and, and uh, you know, folks that, other folks that work with young children. But, but they also have to be, they also have to resonate with policymakers because at the end of the day, those are the folks that are making decisions about programs, about funding, and, and other policies that affect um, your program. So, uh, so that's the, the, the first part of what we advise states to do. Um, and then we have sort of three guiding principles that we, uh, you know, communicate to the states. One is that, you know, right now in the early care and education system, a lot of um, data collection is happening because they are required to do it. Um, and we want to try to change the culture from compliance to using data to continuous improvement, which um, my, the previous speakers have spoken to already. So that's one one uh, sort of guiding principle that, that we try to put out there uh, at the very beginning. Another one is, uh, is uh, to go from these fragmented and siloed efforts to a more coordinated system, and, and you will you, you'll hear more about that a little later. And then from a, a, a data system that, you know, or data that, that is a, take a snapshot of where kids are or where families are to a more longitudinal uh, system where, that allows you to track kids' progress, but also how programs are, are improving and how the workforce is improving, um, and not only in the birth to five arena, but also into the K and how that you know how, how they progress into the public education system. Um, and then the and then once we have uh, have the policy questions and the, and the guiding principles in place, then what we can think about is what you know what are the fundamental components that a data system should have as a sort of a foundational at the FSA foundational level. And, and we, the Data Collaborative, came up with 10 fundamental components, which I'll go over a little later. Uh, so, and that hopefully will be helpful for, guy, for, for states as a, as a policy framework. Um, and then from there, we, you know, as I said earlier, we, we're basically there here to support the activity to, you know, to advance uh, this work. So what we did to um, uh, to start with the policy question is we had a meeting in July of 2009. So this work has has been a couple of years. Uh, we've been doing this work for a couple of years now, um, and we gathered about 40 to 50 sort of thought leaders in the field and and just kind of posed this question to them. You know, if what should a data system be able to help answer? Um, and these are the six questions that came out of that process, not just in that meeting. Uh, that meeting, at the end of that meeting, we had, I don't know, probably a good 80 <laughs> questions or so, and we had to, you know, we went on a listening tour, basically, to, to, to sort of whittle that down to, to these six. And so basically, these six questions asked, you know, what's going on with kids in terms of their access to these early care and education programs and development? What does program quality look like, and how, they, how is it changing over time? And then what does the workforce look like? And are they, well, are they being uh, well supported by the policies and investments that the state, they, they put, I'm sorry, the states put in place? Um, from there, we have to sort of struggle with the idea of, you know, what do we mean by the early care and education data? Um, and so we, the collaborative, recognize that uh, obviously, as everybody knows, you know, young children, there are multiple domains that are important to the development. You know, there's early care and education, there are special needs services, health services, family support services, including home visiting. Um, but for this, for, for our work, at least at this point, we limited our um, sort of universe to the six programs and funding streams that you see in front of you. Um, and the reason to do that partly is to avoid overwhelming people at the task at hand. This is pretty much a you know a very big task already, and um, we, we so we wanted to sort of uh, focus on the core programs and funding streams. 
home visiting did not make it to our list partly because um, you know, I think many states may, may not see it as an early care and education program. Some states look at it as a more of a parenting support or parenting education program. So we didn't want to sort of create too much confusion when we, when we talk to states. Um, and also, as you'll see later, it was kind of difficult to conceptualize how the fundamental elements that I talked about before fit into the context of home visiting programs. But having said all that, states can definitely be more inclusive, and some states are more inclusive in this. Um, but, so this is just really a basic foundation that, that we're putting out there. So these are the 10 fundamentals that we developed as a sort of a policy framework uh, for states to, to consider, hopefully be helpful to guide them in, the, in their process for developing these systems. Um, so, you, and, and the next slide will give you the, the details, but basically we're looking at children, we're looking at sites, we're looking at the workforce and how they interrelate to each other, and also how this data relates to K-12 data and also other uh, data systems, uh, data from other systems and programs that serve young children. In the middle of that, what kind of holds all this together should be the sort of a governance structure that oversees this whole thing, and also some, you know, important privacy uh, policies that protect, you know, provide security to the data so that you know you don't, we don't, we don't compromise anybody's privacy. So these are the ten fundamentals again, sort of spelled out, um, I, and I won't go over them one by one. But um, you see the three categories: children, sites, and workforce, kind of embedded in there. Uh, I just point out that you know one of the important um, thing we we try to get states to to adopt is this use of a unique identifier um, that sh is shared among all the programs, you know, pre-K to head, state funded Head Start to child care. Um, Partly why that's important, you know, that's important because, you, you know, that helps they collect information about each child and track them, you know, through the, through the, prog through, through the you know, the early years of their life. Um, but the other um, advantage to do, have doing this is what Bob, I think, uh, mentioned earlier is that it, it might prevent you from entering data more than once. If you have a unique identifier that's shared among all the programs, you know, let's say including home visiting, then you know you don't have to have four different people entering the name of the child, the birthday, the address, and all that kind of stuff, you know, multiple times. Um, so that's another advantage of, of the unique identifier. Um, the I also want to point out the importance of linking, um, um, you know, data from the site to child, from the child to the workforce, and the workforce to the site. Kind of basically helping you, under, helping the user understand how the, all these. Um, uh, relation, how how these things interrelate with each other, so that you get a comprehensive view of what how the programs are making an impact on kids or or not making an impact on kids, if if that's the case. Um, let's see. Uh, so I want to just uh, again the, the the importance of linking to K twelve data systems and other key programs, uh, so that you have a longitudinal perspective, but not also a comprehensive perspective about about kids um, in a development. And um, yeah, so I think I, uh, I can move on to the next slide. Uh, so, so these are some potential barriers and challenges that when we talk to states, what they sort of the, the top things that they, they come up, they, they, they experience. One is um, you know starting with very siloed agencies and systems. Um, obviously, funding these days is, is a challenge. Um, there's also, you know, as, as everybody knows probably on this call, every, um, there's still a lot of concerns about data collection and, and especially about young children. So um, that's an, it's a, it's sometimes a challenge that people have to overcome. Overcoming the compliance culture to, to adopting a more pro, uh, continuous improvement kind of uh, motivation for collecting data. Um, and then promoting appropriate data use so that they're not, they're not misused. Um, what I can say, and I'll, 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 the good news is that some states have, have addressed this, and I'll, I'll describe some efforts um, later on. But um, what I can say is that uh, our, our partners at the Data Quality Campaign, again, who, who've been doing this for, for a while, you know, tell us that you know, changing the culture of, of um, how people think about data, how they use data, how they approach this work, it's, it's actually harder than uh, learning the technical know-how, you know, developing data systems and stuff, because there's, you know, there's oftentimes a, a, uh, a body of knowledge that's already out there you just need to tap into and have the funding to support. But in terms of changing people's practices and attitudes and behaviors, that's, that's a little bit more difficult, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, 
I also want to make sure we talk about um, appropriate access and use of data because it's not just enough to have a data system, a great data system even, but, but you have to have some policies in place and, and some uh, supports to, to help people use it and access it um, effectively. So, um, you know, it, it obviously needs to be timely and user friendly um, and Bob talked about how, you know, different audiences and that needs to be considered right from the get-go. Um, but, you know, Everybody needs some support to interpret the, interpret the data and then use it to inform the actions, whether you're talking about legislators, to parents, to providers. Um, I think everybody can need some support, and, and so it's something to consider building into your work. Um, and it also speaks to the importance of partnering with research organizations and higher ed communities, people who can help you I understand what you're looking at and, and tell you what you can't conclude from what you're seeing and what you can conclude, so that's very important. Um, and uh, and again, just balancing access to privacy. It, um, it's I, I'm not an expert on privacy laws, but but um, I understand that there there are a lot of sort of gray areas, and it's important to to um, clear that up um, within your states. Um, okay, so I want to give you a couple of examples of states that have done a relatively good job at developing coordinated early care and education data systems. One is Pennsylvania. They have an, a, something called an early learning network that um, basically they built on top of their, an existing system called Pelican. And, the, and it's a pretty comprehensive system. It includes state pre-K child care, the QIS data, and then the IDA Part B and Part C programs. It includes data from, from all those programs and funding streams. Um, it uses a unique ID for, for kids and for sites, program sites and, and, and individual workforce members. Um, and, it, and includes a variety of data, as you see on the slide, uh, about, about those, um, those uh, kids and programs and workforce uh, members. Um, and it also produces a number of reports that are useful for parents, teachers, and providers, and, and at the state level as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, the importance of training, they, they has provided some um, uh, training regular, uh, on a regular basis for the early care and education staff to train them uh, on both, you know, entering data but also using data. Uh, so that's been, uh, that, that's definitely a, a sort of a, a good practice. Um, for Pennsylvania, the next step for them is to link what they're doing there, you know, with this early learning network to the K-12 system. They want to add home visiting, um, you know, you exactly had to know, um, and other kind of human, health and human services programs in their state. Um, and we have a case study on Pennsylvania. This is just a summary, you know, condensed into one slide. So if you're interested, there is a, a uh, brief uh, about the state. The next day is Maryland. And in Maryland, um, they, they have two sort of parallel systems that they're, they're, they're working on linking. But they're in and of themselves, they're, they're you know, rel again, relatively uh, uh, pretty sophisticated. So they have what's called a Maryland model for school readiness. In Maryland, every single kindergarten child when they enter kindergarten is assessed uh, on the kindergarten readiness using a work sampling system um, assessment. Um, so they enter all that data into this system, into this data system. They also include demographics and what and, and information about what um, early childhood program, uh, whether it's a Head Start program, a child care program, or the state pre-K program, what experience the kid had before um, entering kindergarten. Um, and then they link that to the K-12 system. So what they are able to do is to look at the relationship between their experience, um, their early care and education experience, and how that relates to their kindergarten readiness and then how that translates into their performance in the K-12. So that's one system that they have going on. And then the other one is on child care, um, and it includes all licensed programs of young children, um, and inclu including Head Start sites. Um, it uses unique program ID and workforce, and, and they include more workforce data than the, the school readiness um, system that I mentioned before. Uh, so it includes, you know, uh, uh, information about the program quality rating, the workforce data, uh, you know, in terms of credentials and wages and other uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so for Maryland, the next step, I guess I said earlier, is to tr figure out how do these two systems work together. Uh, they want to include more Head Start data, um, and then more, and then collect more data, particularly in the Maryland model for school readiness uh, system on program quality and staff characteristics. Um, and then uh, just some lessons, and, and I think this is one of the last slides, but just some lessons from, from what we've learned about um, from, from Pennsylvania and Maryland. 
One is the importance of a uh, uh, consolidated and coordinated governance. Not to say that if, if your programs, if your early care and education programs are not all sitting in one department or one agency, that you can't do this, but it really was helpful for Pennsylvania, for example, to have the Office of uh, Child Development and Early Learning, which reports to both the Department of Education and the Department of what they call Public Welfare, which is basically the Health and Human Services Department. So because of that office that sits between those two agencies, they were, you know, a lot of this work was, was um, not easy, but, but it facilitated a lot of this work. Same thing in Maryland, in the Department of Education there, uh, houses all of the first to five programs from childcare to state-funded Head Start to state pre-K. Um, so that definitely made things a little easier in those states. The second is to get buy-in and leadership from very top-level policymakers. Um, and, you know, data-driven policy, I think, uh, policy making is kind of becoming a non-negotiable in education. And so it might not be that hard of a sell for policymakers these days, but then, again, there may be still concerns about the appropriateness of co collecting data about young children and the government's role in, in, in doing that. So, um, so, so one, of the th one of the things that's nice about starting with an effort to get consensus on the policy questions uh, that I mentioned at the beginning is that um, that process really, you know, if you do it right, you want to get all the stakeholders involved, including policymakers. So that it raises the awareness, everyone's awareness of what they want to know about early care and education programs and the kids they serve, and what they need in order to find those answers. And oftentimes there are gaps, you know, they're not able to find out what they what they need to know. So, so um, data systems should be, you know, could be a tool to help them help everyone do that to answer those questions. Um, and you also want to look at what policy questions in the state are resonating with policymakers to make to help um, get buy-in from them. Uh, for example, in Maryland, it's the school readiness was this, was this priority in the state, and so they you know, basically worked with the policymakers and said, you know, if you really want to know how these kids are doing when they're in the kindergarten, we need a data system. We need a good you know, tracking system and, and good assessments. And so that's how, kind of how they got the ball rolling. Um, and obviously, the third, third one, third point here, leveraging existing data system. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, one of the first things you should do, I think, is to uh, um, to talk across agencies. Um, I would ur strongly urge you guys, those of you who are who are working on, on home visiting programs, and probably w I don't know what agencies you you interact with most closely, but if you're in the you know Department of Health and Human Services, for example, I would encourage you to look at what the Department of Education is doing, because chances are they're collecting something about the kids and families you're serving. And so in order not to duplicate effort, in order to kind of, um, you know, build on each other's work, I, 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 would, I would sort of take an inventory of what's going on already and, um, and, and, you know, looking at where the data are stored, what's being collected, and what the gaps are. Um, and then uh, I, I think finally to be just creative about funding sources. Pennsylvania get, got started by leveraging some, some funding they got from the Office of Special Education. Um, there's also state longitudinal and data system grants that some states are using to, to um, enhance the early childhood data system. And then Race to the Top might have, you know, for those states that, that have those, that, those grants, they, there might be some money in there to look at how to um, link K-12 systems to, to the early childhood, early, um, childhood years. Um, and I also understand that the health care reform legislation, you know, it should it be funded fully, uh, may, may include some funding that support, that could support early care and education systems. So that's something, you know, just kind of thinking outside the, the box a little bit on that. Um, finally, I just want to, these are the resources that we have on, uh, on the Data Quality Campaign website, and um, uh, I can, I'm happy to share the exact the document if people are interested. Um, and then these are our contact information from the whole collaborative. Uh, if you need to contact any one of us, my, mine is at the bottom. So with that, I think I'm going to throw it to Joe Filene from the James Bell Associates. Great. Thank you, Bob, Albert, and Nova. Um, you've provided us with a wealth of information that will help to guide states, tribes, and territories in the decision-making process related to data systems. As Lauren mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, this is just one of um, this is just one of the webinars and sources of support that we will providing, be providing to the MIE CHB grantees through the Dove contract. Um, so please stay tuned for 
additional webinars and peer learning opportunities, as well as individualized technical assistance for your project as needed, and other information that we will help be providing to help grantees move their projects forward, like a list of measures that can be used to measure progress on benchmarks, um, a peer learning network discussion regarding data systems so that grantees can learn from each other about what they're currently doing with their data systems and what their plans are for the future, um, selecting outcome and be benchmark measurement tools, conducting rigorous evaluations with small sample sizes, and more. Um, and so here we have a list of the upcoming benchmark or upcoming webinars. We have one scheduled for next Thursday, March 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern about measuring me benchmarks. We have another one scheduled on April 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern about conducting rigorous evaluations with small sample sizes. And we also have the, um, the most recent webinar that we did last month on creating a culture of quality, um, and that's located on the website that you can see on this slide here at the bottom. Um, we will also be posting the audio version of today's webinar as well as PowerPoint slides from today's webinar on that on that same website. Um, the PowerPoint slides are already available there, um, but we will be adding the audio component soon. So now we're going to turn to the questions that we've received through the question and answer panel. As a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. We've received a lot of questions, so if we don't get to your question today, we will respond offline. Um, we will be developing a um, fact page that has um, questions and answers that we've obtained through this through this webinar and post the answers there as well. Um, so let's see. Um, the first question that we received um, is directed towards NOVA. And the question is, how much did the independent ass assessment of Palm Beach's data system cost, and how long did, did it take? Or a similar question, can you share the approximate cost for building your data system? OK, the, um, the assessment um, ran from October of 2009 until February of 2010, and it was $110,000. <clears throat> And then um, the data system for the first phase, which will be launched in October of um, this year, we um, we are spending an initial investment of $1.7 million. OK, great. And I'll just remind um, the other um, observers of the webinar that this is for a broader system level data system, so multiple right. programs. So that might be greater than yes, the others are. Yeah, 30, 30 programs involved. OK. Um, and Great. Nova, can you also give some examples of how Palm Beach got feedback from home visitors regarding your data system? And did you also include supervisors in the process? We included supervisors um, and the um, home visitors slash caseworkers um, in the questions. We actually, at first, we sent out uh, um, a, one, a form so we got the information back, and then we took those forms and actually went and met with each individual um, program. So we met with the supervisor and their caseworkers, or the caseworkers that were available to talk to us to go through what exactly are the pain points. So it was really face-to-face. -face. We did not ask them to come into our office. We actually went out to their offices where people are more comfortable and will are able to show you because what we found there also if you don't mind me talking about it a little bit was um, spreadsheets people were using spreadsheets along with the data system and they could pull those spreadsheets right away and say see what I have to be doing to get what I need so it was pretty helpful uh, for us okay thank you and Bob were you going to say something about the previous question yes I just wanted to make a general comment about issues related to cost and that is, uh, I think costs are likely to be uh, uh, quite variable from uh, state to state and program to program. Uh, because see. people are going to be in, in different positions. They're going to want somewhat different things. They may have pre-existing systems that they want to adapt. Some states may have uh, uh, IT personnel who, 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 can, who can work on these kinds of things. 
and it, it's a fast moving uh, uh, industry. So uh, cost changes fairly quickly. So, and, uh, uh, um, excuse me? I have to say, Bob, this is Nova. When we put out the invitation to negotiate, the responses we got, the costs were, we had, we had from low to very high. Yes. So it's <laughs> really varied. Mm -hmm. um, yes. This is Albert. Can I add something to that? Uh, Please. Okay, I just want to mention that in the Pennsylvania case study that um, that's on, on the Data Quality Campaign website, um, there is on the back uh, some information about the, what costs they incurred to develop their early learning network system, and um, obviously that's a broader system, it's not just home visiting. Uh, so if people are interested in that, it, it's also in that publication. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question is, how have you been successful in gaining agreement to a single unique identifier? Many systems have a unique identifier. How do you agree on just one? I can take a crack at that. I mean, I think that if there are multiple systems with unique identifiers, um, yeah, I mean, I think this conversation needs to happen in terms of, you know, how do you link them? Um, some um, uh, program or agencies are able to link the identifiers, uh, you know, by looking at sort of other demographic variables. Uh, some, you know, decide to sort of convert everything to one. So I think it just kind of depends on what um, what your your you know what what the capacity is and, and what what you you can do. Um, I think having one identifier is is, is usually the pre preferable way. I think there's less. Um, sort of the error rate is lower. Uh, I also know that at least in, in one state they were, that I, I had uh, worked with a little bit, they were thinking about, um, you know, looking at um, the, uh, the uh, looking at when, when kids are get born, the Department of Health there, you know, actually assigns identifiers, uh, or, or I don't think they assign identifiers, I'm sorry. They um, have access to the kids, uh, they do screening and that sort of thing um, at that point, and they were thinking about, you know, is that a point where we can actually assign an identifier right from the very beginning and then use that, you know, have that be the, the kids identifier throughout his or her life or at least through the, you know, through high school. Um, so, uh, so that's a thought. I mean, I don't know how far they got along, along uh, in that conversation, but that, that was something they were exploring. Nova, do you have a response to that one as well? I have to say it's a challenge. Um, we, are, we are in the position where we are trying to figure that out, and it's working with all these different entities. Um, so but what we do, we collect what we have. So there is always a way to identify um, across the system. Is it the student ID? Is it the state ID? Is it the Medicaid number? Is it the client ID? So at least we can always search and find the right person, but it's a challenge, and I know it's a challenge across the state. Okay, and a similar question is how do you link um, the mother with the infant, with the father, with the family? Um, do you use an individual client identifier or do you use a family identifier or both? We use both. Or we are about we are working on using both. So each person is an individual client, but then they're in a family unit with a family ID. So you can always keep track of if this person is no longer a part of the family. Um, the family still stays intact. So um, or you can track people as they move from family to family. So we keep a common, um, a, a unique client ID on each person. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, the next question I think is directed towards Albert. And the question is, how can we as home visiting programs link to early intervention data? Um, I, I, you know, I, so I, I want to make sure that people understand I'm not the technical expert in these things. So I, what I would say is, um, I would I would talk to the people in the department of whatever department is sometimes it's education sometimes is is um, uh, human services that work, you know that keep track of that data and see what you can do to to add, you know add home visiting data into the into the existing system um, sometimes it's 
it, it might be just having that conversation um, and be, making people aware that there's you know multiple data collection efforts going on. Um, so that's why I would I would say. Yeah, if I can follow up and uh, uh, just make a general comment about a theme that I think runs through all three of our presentations is that uh, the technical issues are not the biggest issues. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they're often solvable. Uh, it, it's that the more difficult issues are, are really identifying up front what you want and what you need, uh, making sure that you have uh, the uh, collaborations and the, the the working relationships and the difficult discussions across entities, uh, so that that everyone agrees and there's a consensus about how data systems should be set up or how data systems should talk to each other. That's the hard part, uh, particularly if there are multiple pre-existing data systems that were never designed to talk to each other, mm -hmm. uh, or, or you know entities within states that don't typically uh, uh, interact. Mm -hmm. I, and I guess I would add also that we, we recently did a uh, sort of a 50 state scan of what each state has been doing on these early care and education data systems. Um, and one thing, again, not too surprising that we, you know, that came out of that effort is that there are, there, the states are linking data, you know, kids' data across these different early childhood programs. Um, but again, it's a governance structure that facilitates the linking. So you, we find uh, pre-K data being linked to, for example, Part uh, IDA, you know, the Special Ed Part B uh, uh, data, much more. You know, that those, those kind of hang together, and then the, the, sometimes the child care, you know, is more likely to link to health health uh, uh, data. Um, so I, you know, maybe you know, it's just a, sort of a low-hanging fruit strategy is to, is to look within the agency that you already are in, in terms of the home visiting program, and then see how you can make those connections work first, and then see, and then go outside into maybe Department of Ed or whatever other departments you want to link to. Okay, thank you. And so a similar question that we've gotten is how how exactly, or what are your successes? around linking local data systems to systems like WIC or Medicaid? Um, from, a, from our perspective, what we actually do, um, we do external um, referrals. So we're not linking really to the data systems at this point. We're um, referring the clients out um, to these entities and we're actually doing it's not so much of a warm handoff. We are actually um, just sending them on and then following up on what's happening and then logging into our system if a linkage has been made. So we have not really um, linked to those systems or in terms of data yet. It is our hope that over time we'll be able to do this. Okay, the next question is, this seems like an opportunity for states to pool resources and collaborate to develop an orp open source system that allows tailoring by each state. Many of the data elements will be common across all states. Do you have any comments about the pros or the cons of doing this? Um, why don't I tackle this first? And, and I actually I think I wrote a response uh, as well. Um, I, I, we're not in a position, I think, to make a recommendation about uh, this or this kind of strategy. Uh, but I, I think one of the uh, one of the exciting things about uh, uh, sort of the technological age that we live in is there are there are lots of different ways we can tackle these kinds of issues, and, and I think they're all worth uh, uh, considering and discussing and seeing if they fit within that list of needs uh, and whether they're feasible and, and affordable. So I would just make that as a, a general comment. Okay, thank you. And I just want to point out that on the current slide, I've highlighted the website where the where the slides can be found. Um, it's the, the www.mdrc.org, et cetera. So that's where you can get the, the ver this copy of the slides. 
Okay, so the next question is, in the process of selecting data elements for inclusion in your systems, did you use nationally recognized standards to represent the data? Uh, I, I, I guess I can try to tackle that one. I'm, I'm not so sure I fully understand it. Uh, I think what, certainly one of the issues that, that we have in, in home visiting, and this is true in a lot of different areas, is that people do use different measures. And it is desirable that we use the same kinds of measures, and I think we're sort of working towards that. Uh, I'd certainly recommend using you know, common kinds of uh, data definitions so that one can contrast and compare easily. Uh, but I'm not aware of there being sort of a rule book out there. But maybe there is. Uh, Albert, are you? Um, so the one, the one um, sort of area where I think there's some effort to standardize some data definitions out there is uh, on the early care and education workforce data. I know that uh, one of our collaborative partners, the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment out at UC Berkeley, uh, has been working with a number of other groups to, to do that so that when states are collecting data, they, they're to the extent possible, you know, collecting the same data or have a standard for what, you know, what, what the data definition should be. I would also add that, um, you know, this is a kind of the data definition issue is the kind of thing that a governance structure at the state level uh, would be, should be um, sort of charged with working on is so that, um, you know, when you, if you do have a data system that crosses these funding streams and these programs, you do want to know that, you know, if you're collecting, uh, you know, literacy data about a pre-K child in one program and you're collecting the same thing, you know, in a child care program, um, that, that they will be able to talk to each other in terms, you know, that, that when you look, at, you look at those data, that they mean, well, you know, if not the same thing, then, you know, relatively the same thing. Um, so that kind of, that, this kind of um, issue that a governance structure will allow a state to work on um, uh, as a, uh, you know, in a coherent way. Great, thank you. The next question I think is for Nova and maybe Bob. And the question is, how have you set up your data system so that it can speak to other home visiting programs or does staff have to double enter data into your database? In other words, if there are data requirements to enter data into a, a, a database that's maintained by a national model, and you also have your own database, do they have to double enter them? And how have you set it up to communicate between the two? Right. Um, currently, we have the um, Nurse Family Partnership Program. Um, it's a home visiting program. And um, they use the data, our data system. But what we have done, we've worked with the National Service Office of um, NFP and worked out an agreement where we, we upload, we download the data from our system or we extract the data from our system. And we do that here um, as a funder within our IT department. We extract the data weekly and then we upload it to their system. And it works pretty well. Um, the numbers match. So we try to do that as much as possible because double data entry is what we definitely don't want to be doing. So as much as we can, we work out agreements with um, the different organizations and ask to be able to upload our data to them, and it has worked out pretty well for us. Or in some cases, they're sending us data and we're loading it into our system, in some cases nightly. Yeah, I was going to say these are... Uh, uh technical issues that uh, uh, through agreements can be, uh, of course it requires everyone to agree, uh, but once that's uh, uh, resolved, uh, it, w one can set it up so the data is readily extracted and uploaded. There's still a few steps there, uh, and one has to have the technical resources to set that up, uh, but otherwise that's a, a solvable uh, issue. Okay, great. The next question is, what kinds of questions should I ask to make sure the data system I might want to use will be able to talk to other data systems? Well, 
it um, depends that, I'm sorry. This yeah? Is, no. Go ahead. All right, all right. Okay. Well, I'll, 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 I'll take a, a first step. Of course, the first thing is to ask the question. <laughs> so that's that's a good thing to ask of, right. uh, uh, of the, the person or the uh, entity uh, uh, that you're working with. Uh, for it to talk to other, for, for a system to talk to another system, it requires both systems you know, to be uh, set up in a way so that that, uh, that talking occurs. So uh, that has to be a, a dialogue between uh, whoever oversees uh, each system. Right. You but, might, um, not to get too technical, um, get into questions as to which platform the system is on, what kind of files um, you'll be getting or sending, and then the, a very important question becomes how they will receive the file or send you the file, and is there a secure um, method through which that will be done? So are you putting your um, data on a secure site for them to download, or are they putting the data on a secure site for you to download into your system? Because that becomes extremely important. It cannot be email, and um, it cannot be you know a, a, a CD in the in the mail. So those become some of the things you want to address. Um, of course, uh, you want to do your data sharing agreement, so you make sure that you can um, you are covered. You should be receiving this data, or you should be sending this data, and. You want to build a good relationship with the person you're sending or receiving from or to. Mm -hmm. I would just add that I think some of this also goes goes back to the data definition. You want to you know understand when they say you know even something as simple as like a provider. What does that mean? <laughs> um, okay. And so I think you want to you know you want to have that uh, you know clearly laid out. Uh, and then, and then, you know, understanding how the data systems are are uh, attaching the data to the kid or to the site or to the uh, family or or the or the provider is it a unique identifier or is it a uh, you know do they do it some other way maybe through a, you know some you know a, a sort of a, a conf, uh, what I'm trying to say the a, a collection of demographic variables. That um, uh, that that through that method they, they can you know they can you know they can collect data about a certain child and, and follow that child. Um, so how are they doing that? Uh, would be the methodology would be um, something to look into. Great. Well, I'll just we'll ask one more question. I think this is directed actually towards Lauren, and the question is: Can the home visiting funds be used to buy or build a data system? Uh, <laughs> I am, uh, so uh, let me just clarify, I am from ACF and not from HRSA, um, but the information I've received from HRSA would suggest yes, but I, I suggest that you talk to your HRSA project officer to clarify with them. Okay, great. Well, we received a lot of questions and we weren't able to get to all of them, so we will compile those questions and responses and we will post them on the website that we provided earlier. Um, so this concludes today's webinar. We hope to continue this conversation through upcoming peer learning opportunities and individualized technical assistance. We thank you very much for your time.